Section 12.1, Sampling Techniques and Misuses of Statistics. Statistics is the art and science of gathering, analyzing, and making inferences, which are predictions, from numerical information. The numerical information is called data, and this data is obtained in experiments. Statistics are divided into two main branches. There is descriptive statistics, and this is concerned with the collection, organization, and analysis of the data. And then there's inferential statistics, which is concerned with making generalizations or predictions from the data that's collected. A statist statistician's interest lies in drawing conclusions about possible outcomes through observations of only a few particular events. So the population is going to consist of all of the items or people of interest, and the sample is just some of those items. And typically, statisticians work with the sample. When a statistician draws a conclusion from a sample, there is always the possibility that the conclusion is incorrect. A random sampling occurs if a sample is drawn in such a way that each time an item is selected, each item has an equal chance of being drawn. When a sample is obtained by selecting a random starting point and then selecting every nth item in a population, the sample is called a systematic sample. An example of this could be an assembly line where you look at every th 13th item on the assembly line to see if it has um, the characteristics or if it fails your, um, your process as a qualified product. A cluster sample is sometimes referred to as an area sample because it's frequently applied on a geographical basis. So essentially the sampling consists of a random selection of groups of units. So for example, um, let's say we looked at the United States and we subdivided it into 50 states and we were trying to figure out who was going to win the presidential election. We can look at the cluster of so we can look at the cluster of the state of Colorado and use that cluster to predict what the entire United States is going to do. Now ideally, you won't use just one cluster, you'll use more than one, um, otherwise you don't really have a random sample. Another type of sampling is stratified sampling, and this involves dividing the population by characteristics called stratifying factors. So these can be gender, race, religion, income, sexual orientation, etc., etc. Uh, convenient sampling is going to use data that's just easy and ready to obtain, and it can be extremely biased. So, for example, um, I could stand outside of a college and I could ask students that walk in the college how they feel about um, Bernie Sanders' proposal for free community college for everyone. Well, that's going to be extremely biased since most of the people walking in the college are paying for their own education. So let's look at a couple of examples and let's just see if we can identify what type of sampling technique is being used in each of these examples. So um, example A, every 20th soup can, uh, soup can coming off an assembly line is checked for defects. Well, since they have made a systematic number that they're planning on checking, this is going to be systematic sampling. Um, as soon as they decide, I'm going to check the nth number, that is called a systematic. A $50 gift certificate is given away at the annual banker's convention. Tickets are placed in a bin and the tickets are mixed up. Then the winning ticket is selected by a blindfolded person. So we didn't subdivide anybody, um, we didn't start counting anyone. This is just an example of a random sample. Every ticket has equal chance to be selected. Now if they started making certain tickets larger than others, that would no longer be random. Children in a large city are classified based on the neighborhood school they attend. A random sample of five schools is selected. All of the children from each selected school are included in the sample. 
this is going to be a cluster sample because you have split the area up by geographic areas and you ended up using an entire cluster to tell you about the whole geographic area. The first 50 people entering a zoo are asked if they support an increase in taxes to support a zoo expansion. Again, this is um, gonna be a convenient sample. You're asking people who enjoy the zoo whether we should increase taxes for the zoo. Um, your data is gonna be extremely biased and not accurate to the um, actual opinion of the population. All registered vehicles in the state of California are classified according to type, subcompact, compact, midsize, full-size, SUV, and truck. A random sample of vehicles from each category is selected. So notice you broke it up in a group, um, the groups were related by a characteristic that's called a strata. So you have stratified them and then you've selected a sample from each group. So this is a stratified sampling technique. Misuses of statistics. So many individuals, businesses, and advertising firms misuse statistics to their own advantage. So when examining statistical information, consider the following. First, was the sample used to gather the statistical data? Uh, was it unbiased? And is it of sufficient size? And second, is the statistical statement ambiguous? Could it be interpreted in more than one way? Um, oftentimes, you'll be reading through data and you won't see what's not being said. So I'm sure the favorite one everybody sees is four out of five dentists recommend sugarless gum for their pa patients who chew gum. Well, in this advertisement, we don't know what the sample size is. <clears throat> we don't know the number of times the experiment was performed to obtain the desired result. And the advertisement does not mention that maybe only one out of 100 dentists recommend you chew gum at all. So this could be an extremely, um, extreme misuse of statistics. How about this one? In an advertisement for golf balls, a driver golf ball is hit and another brand of golf ball is hit in the same manner. We're told that the driver golf ball travels farther and we're supposed to conclude that the driver golf ball is a better golf ball. Well, the advertisement does not mention the number of times the experiment was previously performed or the results of the earlier experiments. Possible sources of bias could include the wind speed and direction, that no two swings are the same, and that the ball may land on a rough or smooth surface. This could all impact the length of the driver ball. Vague or ambiguous words also lead to statistical misuses or misinterpretations. The word average is one such culprit. There is at least four different averages, some of which are discussed in section 12.3. Each is calculated different and each may have a different value for the same sample. So for example, during contract negotiations, it is not uncommon for an employer to state publicly that the average salary of his employees is 45,000, whereas the union states that the average salary is 40,000. The question is, who's lying? Actually, both sides could be telling the truth. Each side will use the average that best suits its need to present its case. And since there's four different averages, each side could have a valid number. <clears throat> Advertisers also use the average that most enhances their product. So consumers will often misinterpret this average as the one which you are the most familiar with, which is typically how we go about figuring your grade. Another vague word is largest. For example, Harding's claims that it is the largest department store in the United States. Does that mean the largest profit, the largest sales, largest building, largest staff, largest acreage, or largest number of outlets? You just don't know. They were very vague. Still another deceptive technique um, used in advertising is to state a claim from which the public may draw irrelevant conclusions. For example, a disinfectant manufacturer claims that its product killed 40,760 germs in a lab in five seconds. So they could tell you, to prevent cold, use disinfectant A, or insert brand name. It may well be that the germs killed in the laboratory were not related to any type of cold germ. So you could be 
just wasting your time if that's what your goal is. Company C claims that its paper towels are heavier than its competitor com competition's towels. Therefore, they'll hold more water. So is weight a measure of, of absorbency? Well, a rock is heavier than a sponge, yet a sponge is going to hold a lot more water. An insurance advertisement um, claims that in Duluth, Minnesota, 212 people switched to insurance company Z. One may conclude that this company is offering something special to attract these people. But what they may have omitted from the advertisement is that 415 people in Duluth dropped insurance company Z during the same period. A foreign car manufacturer claims that 9 of 10 of a popular model car is sold in the United States during the previous 10 years were, were still on the road. From this statement, the public is to conclude that this foreign car is well manufactured and would last for many years. The commercial neglects to state that this model has been selling in the United States for only a few years. The manufacturer could just as well have stated that 9 of every 10 of these cars sold in the United States in the previous 100 years were still on the road. Charts and graphs can also be misleading. Even though the data is displayed correctly, adjusting the vertical scale or your y-axis of a graph can give a different impression. Um, while each graph represents identical information, the vertical scales have been altered. So if you notice on the second graph, see the little break in the graph? Notice they're starting the graph at 25 instead of at 0. This creates the slope of the stock to look a lot steeper, making you think the stock is making a lot more money than it actually is. They can also do this on bar graphs, so they can show you that break. Notice graph 1 is only showing a vertical change of 5 units, whereas graph 2 is showing a vertical change of 100 units. So that change in the scale makes graph 1 look like there was a giant change in results. Another way they can do it is with area. So consider the claim that if you invest $1 by next year, you will have $2. This type of claim is sometimes misrepresented. Actually, your investment has only doubled, but what they did instead was they showed it by doubling the side length of the box. So you actually have a visual of four times the money, not double your money. They can make it even worse by turning it into a volume problem because if you double each side of a volume problem, you will actually have a visual of eight times your money. A circle graph can sometimes be misleading. The way they do that is they have all the parts add up to be more or less than 100%. So for example, if you look at this um, image, it's the six reasons Americans say they use the internet. So if you started adding them together, you have a 42%, a 49%, 15, 16, 24, 37. Wait a minute. There's 183% on that graph. You can't do that. So if rather than using a circle graph, they should have displayed it in some other way, maybe a bar graph. Despite the examples presented in this section, you should not be left with the impression that statistics is used solely for the purpose of misleading or cheating the consumer. As stated earlier, there are many important and necessary uses of statistics. Most statistical reports are accurate and useful. You should realize, however, the importance of being an aware consumer.